Hey everybody, welcome back to our mini series all about the future of HR and the ready and Sam and me. What's up, Sam Sperlin? <laughs> this, this podcast is about me. This, this is the best <laughs> intro we've had so far. And I feel like we've maybe missed the mark on really exploring who I am over the last however many episodes we've done. Well, today's your chance, I guess. I don't know, you can work it in. All right, I'll see what I can do. Folks, it's 85 degrees well in done. my so office hot. right now. Oh my God. Rodney so is in like a sauna as well. I am, so, basically. Yeah, we're doing our best. So, today we are coming. Oh, it says coming in hot in the script, which is appropriate since oh. we're both literally sweating right now. We're coming in hot with episode 10. We are going to talk about org debt, which is a concept you might know or you might not know, but it is a vicious, pernicious, malicious thing hiding in your org and preventing you from doing important work. And HR, I'm sorry to say it, is a real contributor to the creation and maintenance of org debt. So we're going to talk all about that today. But first, Sam, chomp into the bit to do a check-in round. Let's hear it, buddy. <laughs> well, now I'm distracted by apparently this slam poetry org design that we're, we're doing here. You didn't write that down ahead of time? I did. Pernicious. <laughs> I malicious. Did <laughs> I did. I, maybe after five, I'm a poet. I don't know. I guess, I guess so. Rodney, here's a check-in question for you. Do you remember the first CD you ever bought? And if so, what was it? You know what? This is not very embarrassing. I wish I had a better answer. I grew up in a real listen to music household, and my parents were like not huge fans of pop music. And I was very much raised on Motown and the British Invasion. And I truly, as a child, thought that that was like modern music. And I believe <laughs> that my first CD was The Beatles' Help. Which is a great album, not my yeah. favorite Beatles no album, shame there. but a great album, and I still enjoy it. Nice. What about you? That's great. Yeah. I also have no shame. It was three <laughs> CDs. I remember. One was just some random piano instrumental. I don't know why it caught my eye. Maybe I felt like I needed something to do homework to. On my you were nerdy even back Sony then. Walkman. You were like, "How do I do? Wait, what do I do with deep work? What should I? What's the soundtrack to my deep work?" Exactly. And then the soundtrack to my party times was mm. Alanis Morissette, "Jagged Little Pill," oh, Sam. and <laughs> and <laughs> Hanson. Those were my. That was my trifecta. My first three CDs, walking around very very smoothly, trying to make my CD player not skip. But like the it's, range, bro. I know. I contain multitudes. You sure are a <laughs> renaissance child. Oh, yep. my God. That's amazing. That was very fun and very good. All right. I feel like considering we've only been talking for like two minutes, we've really already covered some terrain here. But now it's time to plunge into the land of org debt. Sam, why don't you tell people what org debt is? Maybe I'll learn something, too. Let's hear it. Hmm. Maybe, hmm. maybe, maybe you will. So when I talk about org debt with folks, I generally try to compare it or contrast it with more familiar types of debt. Financial mm -hmm. debt, which you may be familiar with, I am familiar with, thanks student loans, woo, uh, woo. and technical debt. So technical debt maybe you'd be less familiar with if you're not in a technical role where you are writing software, but you can think of technical debt as kind of shortcut decisions that you make along the way that are kind of just good enough decisions, but they can kind of accrue on top of each other. And eventually you get to a point where you have to refactor the code base to pay down some of that technical debt. So those are two types of debt we may be familiar with. Organizational debt then, there is the accumulation of policies and processes and ways of working and ways of being within an organization that very frequently served a very good purpose at one point. We had a reason for introducing this bit of org debt at a time, but because most organizations do not have any sort of org debt pay down practice, yeah. They just build on top of each other, on top of each other, on top of each other until you have some sedimentary rock that is made of org debt. And we call that bureaucracy. Great. And I feel like just to add to the metaphor that you started with, I feel like when I worked in HR 
And a lot of HR teams that I see, if you think about what financial debt is like, when it compounds, you end up just paying interest and not ever getting at the principal. Mm, right. And that's what working in HR can feel like. You're just like moving deck chairs around on the Titanic. Like every day is just like, how do I check this box or say this got done or make sure that we are in compliance with this thing that actually no one cares about? And that's all like interest on the yeah. org, but actually like doing the important work of the org or really making changes in the org would be the principle that you never get to. You never even make a dent in it. Yeah. I just realized that I think a reason that organizations have such an easy time accepting organizational debt is that they have a place called HR where yeah. they can kind of shunt it off to and yeah. not have to think about it. And there's a whole function that has to spend a lot of their time dealing with the org debt. Totally. Absolutely. And they're just like, how can we know? I don't know. HR will track it forever. Yeah. yeah. And Sam, I want to talk about examples of org debt. We're going to talk about so many, y'all, because there are so many. And in addition to the things that Sam listed, org debt can also be like whole roles that aren't needed anymore, but we do shit to keep them busy because we don't want to actually like yeah. – change or shed roles. They can be old like structures or old teams that shouldn't really exist in the current evolution of the system. But we're like, ah, but we love yeah. Bob's team. Like we will find them yeah. something to do. Like it can really lurk anywhere. Yeah. And I'll, we'll get into the examples. But before we do counterintuitively, I want to ask you, besides the fact that it's just nobody's job to kind of like pay it down. There's no org debt czar. Why do you think companies are hesitant to shed org debt? Because I get resistance in this in clients when I'm like, hey, here's a thing no one cares about. Why do you guys spend 40 hours a month on it? And they're like, because we do. Yeah. Why is that? Tell me about the human psychology of upholding useless, expensive debt. Yeah, well, I think one very real reason is that one person's organizational debt is another person's full-time job. There are... <laughs> I mean, from my perspective, what looks like organization debt is really just what you're there to do. So sure. you can't just come in and be like, stop doing this thing and have no sort of foundational education around, well, you know, maybe we can have roles, not souls. And you not doing this thing doesn't mean that you no longer have a job or a role yes. here. It's like we're going to shift that around. But if you don't have that foundation, you coming in and saying, well, this is org debt is just going to throw up lots of barriers for those folks who are working very hard servicing that org debt. Totally. I think that's totally true. And I also think that because a lot of times things are put in place because something bad happened. So a lot of, so I'll, yeah. I'll start with an example. I <laughs> used to do a lot of severance conversations. I worked in a bank during the financial crisis. And so there was a lot of that going on. And basically, as an HR person, it was our job to like know enough about the people who were being laid off to understand the landscape of risk and to advise the MDs who were making the decisions about potential pitfalls and lawsuits and also human concerns or whatever. And at the scale of people that were being laid off, new information and like new problems would crop up in one of those severance conversations. And I'll give you an example. I was in a conversation with a woman who we did not know until the meeting was in the middle of adopting a child as a single parent from another country. And she was like, yo, if I lose my job right now, this adoption is going to fall through, which is horribly sad and obviously very concerning to this person and to us. And coming out of that conversation, when I went back to my team and was like, holy shit, what should we do about this? They were like, well, we need to add that possibility to the checklist. So it's like every time a thing took us by surprise, it got added to a checklist that then we had to check for the next hundred to forever people who were being laid off, even if that situation was never going to happen again. So you can imagine the checklist just goes from like the three things you should know to like 30 things you should know. And then you multiply that by laying off hundreds of people. And you can imagine the way that the preparation starts to look for doing layoffs. Right. I'm going to play devil's advocate for just a second, because I think maybe some listeners will be thinking this. They're thinking, hey, this is a pretty major situation that had like major ramifications for a person. 
we're just putting a little thing on a checklist. Is it really that bad that you have to ask 100 people if this is their situation, if it prevents the harm that you just described? Great question. This is how it happens. This is how I'm it doing happens. doing it right now. <laughs> You're doing the thing. So what Sam just did is what always happens in companies. And the question is, is it worth it? No, probably not. Is it worth it if it happens again? Maybe. But if it's a single data point, and the reality is, for example, in this example, we were able to work with this person who was leaving the company and her manager and our team to figure out an arrangement. Like it was not an irreparable situation. And if it had happened again, we could have figured it out again. And to me, the cost of trying to prevent something that may never occur again versus yeah. the cost of triaging something emergent in the environment is most people make the wrong trade-off. Most people yeah. make the and wrong trade-off because it feels like cold comfort that it's like, I did not like being in that room and getting that news. And so now I'm going to check this box and like, I feel a little bit safer than I felt yesterday. But like, you're not safer and you're just spending more time. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I think, you know, why it is so, to cite our opening slam poem, so pernicious is the cost is invisible. And it's yes. not something that you personally likely have to pay. You're putting it yes. on a checklist that other people forever into the future have to deal with. And maybe that's you a couple more times, but really you're not seeing it scaled across a huge organization. And the larger your organization is, the smaller these little pebbles eventually turn into huge boulders because they yes. scale across thousands of people. Yes. And one new small policy that is meant to prevent a mistake that happened. This happens a lot when somebody makes a mistake in a transaction and then you add a layer of approval or you add a four eyes check or you add whatever. When you multiply that over dozens of transactions and hundreds of people and dozens of years, you're potentially costing millions of dollars in human hours and nobody wants to look at that and nobody wants to be the one who goes, let's actually like take that off the checklist. And like, we don't really need that policy. And also no one's really convinced that that policy has prevented a similar mistake again ever. So is it really worth the money that we're paying for it? Because to your point, they don't know what they're paying for it and it's no one's job. And it feels dicey to go like, it probably won't happen again. The next mistake will probably be a different mistake. And we're always governing in arrears, which is expensive and also does not prevent much of anything. Yeah, I know. It's unfortunate as well, because I think most folks like the feeling of cleaning things out. I'm totally. talking about just like uh, physically, I mean, Marie Kondo, we get some Marie yeah. Kondo are organizations. What am I talking about? Yeah. But it's hard for organizations to get there. But I think I have seen and I think the ready is a culture where we're like, we love finding org debt and killing it. Like we take pride Absolutely. in that every month Absolutely. when we are at our all company meeting, we take some time, we all dive into murmur and we find stuff that is no yep. longer accurate, no longer up to date. And like, what can we get rid of? And that is just a muscle that we are developing. There's no reason non self-managing organizations can't do the same thing. So before we get into why this is HR's problem, because y'all, it kind of is your problem, I'm sorry. It's other people's problems too, but it's your problem more. I want to talk about some examples of org debt so that everybody has a really clear idea in mind. So yeah. we've talked about adding policy after a mistake happens. We've talked about adding to checklists until they become sort of useless. What else have you seen that's particularly gnarly or just costly or just common? Zombie meetings, a meeting that once was a vibrant operating rhythm for a really important piece of work. And that piece of work has been finished for a long time, whether or not we've admitted it to ourselves or not. And the work and the rhythm just kind of continues ad infinitum. That's a good one. I also would add reporting. Mm, yeah. One of the best org debt little experiments I did in an early client of mine at the ready in a workshop a woman who was working in finance sort of fessed up that she spent about four days a month on a report and she was pretty sure nobody read it. And the experiment that she was going to run was to not send it and see if anyone emailed her and no one did. And she got four full days a month back yeah. from that little experiment. So meetings, reporting, 
What else? The other angle that I was going to take on reporting is, and this, if you're sitting here listening to this as a senior leader, thinking very carefully about the ripples that your words create within mm-hmm. an organization. I have seen lots of leaders who are receiving you know, a certain kind of stack of reporting on a whatever basis, and they don't actually understand how much work goes into creating this. And when they understand it, they're like, I don't ever want to see this again. I am not right. getting nearly enough value this. from this. Let's just stop doing it. But one time they said, like, oh, it'd be nice to see this number in this way. And now four people spend, you know, each of them half a day getting that number just the right way. And that's not serving anybody. Yeah. Since I have delved back into the HR sphere, the number of systems that don't talk to each other, where there are people who are doing duplicate reporting or duplicate data entry, or there's no golden source or whatever is still quite high. If you're finding yourself spending a lot of time copying and pasting, you're probably servicing some organizational debt that could be automated or connected in some way. Agreed. And then there's this whole body. So we're talking about stuff where it's like an explicit thing exists that we have to service or do or invest in to make it go. And then there's this whole other category of org debt where it's like, we are not taking the time to be clear. And so the debt comes from figuring it out every fucking time where it's like, I'm not going to decide who has the final say, but every time we make this decision, I'm going to have to have 15 conversations to line people up. That's its own debt. That is the chaotic side of org debt, as opposed to the bureaucratic side of org debt, where it's like, we're not going to write the workflow down, or we're not going to clarify the authority, or we're not going to like specify the way we do it. And it is going to cost us hugely every time we rinse and repeat. Yeah. And that version of org debt, I think might be even harder to root out because it's so intertwined with people's sense of power within an organization. If Mm. I am the keeper of the chaos and people have to come to me or I have to orchestrate the chaos, then I am an important person. And if we figure that stuff out, well, then what what am I going to do? Yeah. I mean, we're going to talk about the psychology of this. The only other thing I want to say on the macro level of org debt, which is obviously harder to chip away at, but there are whole org-wide norms and processes that everybody knows don't work the way they're supposed to, and every year they're just done again. So, like, I have been in several companies in my career where the budgeting and forecasting process was a known theatrical performance of garbage. And yet, every year in August, it was like, sharpen your pencils, guys. It's time to start guessing for three more months. Even though in the room, the execs are like, we don't know. And this is going to be like overtaken by events by January. But time to make the donuts. Like, that Performance management, I mean, come Yeah, that's the one that I was going to point to for the HR audience. There's, Y'all. I can't think of m- much of anything else that has more theater, maybe just budgeting within large organizations. So much, yeah. just everybody on the same page about how this is not really helping anybody. And we all just kind of got to put our heads down and get through it together. Exactly. And that there's, you know, statistically in like a third of cases, performance management makes performance worse at the, at the employee yes. level. It's just like... Well, yeah, we're a, managing it. We're just managing it down. Just poorly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> For some reason, I'm really embodying our more pessimistic listeners today. So I'm just going to I'm just gonna roll with it. It's probably just a sign of the day that I've had, which we won't get <laughs> into. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the very regulation-minded folks may be kind of like sitting on the edge of their seats here and being like, ah, yeah, but a lot of what you're talking about is about like how we meet regulations, how we stay in compliance. And I would actually argue most org debt actually is hiding real risk. And it is giving you the illusion of being in compliance, of meeting regulations, and letting people off the hook for actually knowing what the regulations are and what actual compliance looks like. Totally. I mean, I have friends who are still in the financial services industry whose whole job is to close audit points, but like they're not fundamentally changing the OS 
of their company. They are doing what they need to do in terms of like numbers and reporting to close those points. Like it's not actual risk mitigation. It is an exercise in compliance that will make everyone feel like they did something, but not actually mitigate or slim down or adapt risk in any way at all. So Sam, why is this such an issue for companies now? And why particularly do we feel like this is a challenge for our people people to tackle? Yeah, well, so we've already kind of alluded to a couple of, of reasons that HR is really feeling the brunt of this, you know, being a bit of a dumping ground for other people's org debt, and then not only just a place to store org debt, but now you're in charge of actually making it happen. So, you know, HR is running a lot of org debt, a lot of policies for other parts of the organization. They don't own it, so they don't even necessarily have the context for is this real org debt or a thing that actually needs to be done? It's all appears the same, so we might as well treat it the same. And therefore, you've got a ton of work to do. Maybe not all of it needs to be done. And then I think this a really, you know that really sad stat about transformation success? Do. It's like it's single digits good. or something. Yeah, it's bad. I mean, people argue about the specific number, which is stupid because it's very low. And... Most transformations fail, whether we're talking about cultural transformations. I mean, even tech transformations, I think, fare a little bit better, but not necessarily that much better, considering how many projects the Ready has come into where we're basically cleaning up after a failed tech transformation. Totally. So what happens when those transformations fail? Well, a lot of times they leave a whole lot of work debt behind. There are half-finished, half-baked things that have spun up during a transformation, and some get sunset as they should, but many things just kind of wow. live in this in-between phase that turns into org debt because nobody's really sure, is this the new thing? Is this the old thing? How do we actually do this thing? I don't know. We have to Now we're actually running two processes because we have the new one from the transformation and the old one because the transformation never finished. So now we have double. And I mean, that falls into HR's lap quite, quite a bit. Yeah. The point that I just want to like double tap, I hate that expression, but you know, double click, do? double click. I just want to double click into this for a second is this idea. Like when I was in HR and I know this still to be true, if corporate <laughs> was like, we're doing succession planning using a nine box grid and the success factors technology, go make your clients do it. And after we did it, my clients were like, that was a waste of time. We got nothing out of it. I could give the feedback, but I didn't have any authority to just not do it. There was no place that I could go and be like, hey, so neither the technology nor the framework nor the discussion did what it was supposed to do. So they don't want to do it anymore. That would have been considered my failing for not right. either convincing them to do something that they didn't find valuable or having strong enough relationships that they would just do it anyway <laughs> because I asked oh, them to. Oh, what a to. crock of shit. I'm I, so <laughs> – I'm sorry. Sometimes <laughs> I – Sometimes I wish I had more <laughs> HR experience so that yeah. I, I could like really be speaking from a place of like, oh, I have felt this. And then sometimes I hear stuff like that and be like, I'd get fired in the first week because yeah. that is that that is such a frustrating place to to be in. I can yeah. empathize with that. But you don't. You just get like slowly broken down until it's like the situation in that old psych experiment where they open the door to the cage and the monkeys stay inside. Yeah. You're just like, yeah. I don't know. I don't want to go out there. I hate it in here, but I'm not going. <laughs> so there's that thing. It's the, you know, the rinse and repeat and having no authority to actually make changes. And the other big thing, just as a callback to our episode with Meg, where we talked about centralization and decentralization, is part of the fucking of org debt is when you're in HR and you're trying to create a process, let's say you're trying to create a process for return to office and you're trying to figure out what is the policy that we are going to comply with. What generally happens is you are instructed and incented and just habituated to creating something that is complicated enough to work for every eventuality. So it's like the policy starts with being like, everyone's going to be in the office on Wednesdays. And then one of your internal clients is like, I don't work on Wednesday. And it's like, 
parenthetical, except for the legal team, who will be in the office on Thursdays. And then someone else is like, actually, we want to do one week in the office a month instead of one day. And like, by the time you create something that is acceptable to everyone, it is so fucking complicated that it is useful to no one. And this is where the idea of centralization and decentralization exists, is that the centralized policy is something that is well-informed and well-tested and that we've experimented with, etc. But at the edge, you all pick and decide and configure for your context. And that's a really big shift because a lot of the debt that is held in HR is held by centralizing hiring processes and compliance processes and performance processes, et cetera, and having to try to make a complicated workflow that works for everyone. And then it just gets so fiddly and it gets too hard to administer and it also loses meaning. Totally. So those are some of the big chunky bits that are HRs to look at and to concern themselves with. And also, I really want to invite HR folks to start paying attention to what kind of org debt they're paying interest on and upholding because HR has the capacity crunch in most places that is preventing them from getting after the shit that really matters to them, that really matters to the business, that really relates to the value stream of the organization. And basically, if you don't like put some of this shit down, you are never going to be able to pick that shit up. And you just have to be clear eyed about that as a team. And, and it's not both and is this is not yes and improv. This is like, no, this thing that we all know doesn't really serve us and doesn't really get us the value that it was meant to. We are going to full stop doing it because we're going to do something that matters instead. Boom. I'm fired up. What are we going to do instead? Are you see fired up, Sam? Every other episode. See maturity models. See mission based teams and platform teams and Love doing it. shit that matters. So you started to name the things, but for real, for real, what about our view on the future of HR starts to solve this org debt problem that HR has not previously solved, despite very good intentions and very smart people? Do you remember? All those months ago, I think maybe our first episode, we were talking about where do missions come from? What's a good I mission do to that. even do? I do. We had a nice chat about that. I think often a nice mission is to go find and destroy some org debt. Mm. And it could be a bunch of little things. It could be one major thing that we know is really causing a lot of problems. But I know in our work, a lot of times early stuff that we're doing with a client is how do we get more capacity? So. Yeah. Clearing out some org debt is a way to create more capacity. So yeah, you do need to have a little bit to like spin up a team to go do it, but you can start so small. I mean, get rid of those zombie meetings. Like it'll be fine. Yeah, I totally agree. I think the sort of bounty Marie Kondo style missions are good ones. Also, spicy take. I've had a couple of conversations lately. I'm not going to lie. You guys, I can't lie about my forays into HR organizations. I am not always seeing the courage to prioritize that I wish I was seeing friends mm. among HR leaders. And here's what I'll say. When we decide that we are going to do something important as a mission-based team, miraculously, a bunch of really dumb shit often just goes by the wayside. And we've talked about this on this show before. Generally speaking, we see this happen when there is a black swan event. So we see people come together right. when we have an imposed deadline from the external environment and we have no choice but to prioritize it because the world won't wait. And the hat trick here is create that kind of vibe and mindset and feeling and urgency and get after itness for ourselves and put down the dumb shit that everybody knows doesn't matter so that you can go do this thing. And I just had a conversation with someone the other day about this topic who was like, we could never get the capacity to do a mission. And I was like, what do you do when people quit or like have babies? Like, does the company right. stop working? What happens there? Because I'm certain that there are times where either you don't have a full roster of folks or you have to do something you weren't expecting to and somehow everything doesn't just like grind to a halt. So like 
this is a figure outable problem. We've seen it yeah. figured out a million times. You just have to have a little bit of chutzpah. Gumption. Gumption. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and yeah. I know that I'm being spicy about it, but it is just annoying to me a little bit sometimes when people are like, I really want it to be different. And also I want it to be exactly the same. And I'm like, well, you can't have it both ways. Yeah, no, that's that's tough. It's tough. So given we just talked about AI and I think the last episode, if it wasn't the last, it was one of the recent ones. I think that is another interesting place to play, not AI specifically necessarily, but just automation, process literacy work in general. Another way to create space is to look at the stuff that is on your plate every day and figure out ways that it takes less time, less mental bandwidth to actually get that stuff done. And I have seen some teams, some individuals who have you know, set aside a couple of hours on a Friday for a few weeks to learn how to use Zapier or learn an AI tool or just even like set up some macros in Excel and suddenly clean up a bunch of time to actually have some space to do some other things and maybe find some other org debt to get rid of. And related, in a lot of companies, especially big companies, processes are broken up and spread out across the org chart. And what that looks like is like, I do my part and then I throw it over the fence to Sam and then Sam does his part and he throws it over the fence to somebody else. And a lot of times in MBTs that I've coached, when there is a particularly gnarly and complicated process and we don't worry about the org chart or the silos and we do get a mission-based team together to fix it or to simplify it or to understand what about it is not working, a huge amount of org debt gets retired and capacity gets freed up just by us looking at the thing together in the room, whether it is a financial process or a yeah. technical process. I did this with a supply chain leadership team that had it a truly like a very necessarily complicated process. And they were able to strip like 17 steps out of the process when they were all in a room together. So right. a lot of times when people are like, oh, we could never find the capacity to do this. I'm like, well, that's because you're using the capacity to do this. You got to just redirect it to yeah. fixing it rather than just upholding it. Yeah, I love that one. Sometimes the way to cut through org debt is just to get people in a room and have a conversation. I've sometimes described the work that I do at the ready as forcing adults to get into rooms and have conversations they know they should but don't want to have. Uh, yeah. And this is like a, a version of that. Absolutely. A lot of times I've found a lot of org debt that's hidden in lack of clarified decision rights. Yeah. So totally. there's like a lot of toing and froing and deck making and massaging and back and forth and passive aggressive behavior that's very expensive in terms of human hours because we actually just don't know who can say yes. Yeah. But being explicit about that, especially when you notice that there's a lot of swirling and a lot of stakeholdering and a lot of massaging around something, that is org debt if it is not useful, if it is not creating yeah. value or making that decision better or that process better or that something faster. Like there's probably org debt hiding in that. Totally. I've got one more that is less about eliminating existing org debt, but more about making sure you don't create new org debt. I'm interested Ooh. to hear your take on this one. You can eliminate org debt or you can prevent org debt from accruing by being okay with sometimes just doing things. And what I mean is that mm. you don't have to turn a thing into a process or scale it or spread it widely just because we did it once. I think there's a yeah. lot of good intention around like, oh, we did this experiment and it seemed okay. It seemed pretty good. Like, how do we make more people do it? And a lot of time, I think there's premature scaling and processization happening when we would be better served by keeping things in the realm of the experimentation phase of stuff a little bit longer. Hard agree. And another take on that same prevention topic is MVPs. Yeah. You can often actual prevent- Actual MVPs. Actual MVPs. You can <laughs> yeah. often prevent a lot of org debt by not trying to design for every eventuality and by starting with, okay, rather than trying to create an op rhythm of meetings for the year, let's start with getting this group together once a week for an hour for a month and see what we learn from that. And then we can yeah. figure some other stuff out based on the needs that become clear to us by actually doing something. Yeah. 
You know, yeah. this goes back to things that you and I have talked about on this show, and we've talked about in the Brave New Work show a million times, which is like, you don't learn anything by planning. You don't learn anything by sitting in a vacuum and trying to determine what's going to happen. You learn by poking the system and getting feedback. And a lot of times those big complicated plans become organizational debt. And a way to avoid them is by just starting really small and bolting on rather than making something monolithic that then you have to uphold. Amen. I feel like that that's the first time the word amen has been said on this podcast, and I, I'm here for it. Amen. That's right. That's mm-hmm. right. So, Rodney, we've been talking for a while now about how org debt shows up in systems, how systems cause org debt, but embedded within these systems are these things called human beings. And I'm wondering if we have a take or if you have a take about kind of where org debt comes from in the realm of the individual. <sighs> I do. So our friend Ali Randall and I did a bunch of work on this several years ago. There are links in the show notes so that you all can go and watch my stupid face on a video explaining this if you'd like to. But she and I really dug into this idea that org debt is a bit of a cycle that often gets kicked off by an unmet need in a human being. And like at work, as in life, we have some very basic human needs. The ones that she and I have talked the most about are the needs for autonomy, individual agency, connection, being in relationship with others, and safety. I'm talking about like physical and psychological safety. And what we see is that those unmet needs tend to trigger certain kinds of responses in people that create one of two flavors of org debt. The first flavor is the more bureaucratic flavor that you and I started this show talking about. So I'll give you an example. Let's say that I have an unmet need for connection. I'm like, I don't trust these people around me. I am not in relationship with them. I don't like them. They don't like me. And as a leader, what that might lead me to is more command and control behavior, which on its face is generally not good, but is often very rational response to say, I can't trust that Sam is going to do what I ask him to. So I am going to insist and manage and force the behavior that I want to see. There are lots of problems with that, but the biggest problem is that that results in a permission culture, which over time and over reps, Sam stops doing anything interesting, useful, et cetera. Check. Check. He's, <laughs> check. We get into a mother may I situation because he's accustomed to being micromanaged. And over time, we end up with teams that are like apathetic and stuck. Like the learned helplessness becomes high in response to that command and control culture. The unfortunate reality of this is that when we have learned helplessness on our teams, that leader will feel ever more disconnected. Because they're like, these people don't even care. This is why I have to be this way. So that's like the bureaucratic flavor. It truly is a cycle so that it will continue. So I will now be more bureaucratic and come down harder and and be more confused about why. And it just doesn't necessarily end at any good point. Yeah, I feel like we've all seen that movie. The other flavor of org debt is the more chaotic side. So we talked about this too, where we refuse to be clear. Again, Think about an unmet need in a leader. Maybe this is for autonomy. I see this a lot in founders. So I started a company because I don't want a boss and I want to do whatever I want and you're not going to tell me shit. And what that sometimes leads to is avoiding things like clarifying my roles, clarifying rules, clarifying expectations, guardrails of any flavor. Guardrails of any flavor. Because I'm like, you're not going to pin me down. I'm free, you know? Over time and at scale, that often results in an influence culture where it's like, Sam doesn't know what he can decide. The only way to get a yes is to go and influence Rodney behind the scenes to get what you want. Because, you know, depending on the day and who's last in the room, her mind might change. That influence culture, again, over time and at scale, leaves teams dependent on a leader And like quite inefficient because that kind of way of working, not clarified, not consistent, not coherent, it's just super, super inefficient. And when they become dependent, that increases my felt lack of autonomy because I'm like, why are you all asking me all the time? This is why I don't write things down because you need me and I need to be the decider at all times. You can see a visual of this in the video. The point is... 
Most teams and companies swing between the two sides of over-constraining and under-constraining. And usually when we really dig into the root and what's at the core, there is human psychology at work. And there is a person or a small group of people who are trying to repair a need that they feel is not being met that is fundamental and foundational to them working. So it's a thing to look out for. And I'm also saying it here because of all of the things that you and I talked about, which are mostly quite pragmatic and very rational, there is just as much of this that's about mindset. There is just as much about this that's like, what am I missing as a person? And is what I am about to propose really going to fix it? Or is it going to over-constrain or under-constrain the people around me in some undue and dysfunctional way? Yeah. What I love about this visual and everything you just talked through is that I think for a somewhat self-aware leader, it can be incredibly Mm. valuable to think through this and think through frustrations you've been having and ask yourself, am I showing up in one or potentially both of these flavors? And, you know, what might I want to do about that? There's a locus of control aspect to this that I find very pleasing as someone who is like trying to get better at things like this. Absolutely. And it can also just help you as that self-aware leader to dig in to what's really going on for you and potentially to have conversations with people that are like, hey, you know what? Like, I don't really want to write my roles down because I had really bad experiences with having bosses that were unfair and micromanaging and over-constraining and abusive. And I started this company so I didn't have to deal with that shit anymore. And it like gives me hives when you tell me you want me to clarify my role, which isn't to say I shouldn't do it, but just so you know, that's what's up. And that is back to the uncomfortable conversations that we know we should probably have, but maybe don't want to have. But maybe don't want to. Keeps keeps coming back to that. Mm. So annoying. So we got to wrap it up because Sam and I are wilting in our booths. But the last thing I want to tell you, I know we really are. The last thing I want to tell you about work debt is in our capitalistic growth at all cost, never have a down quarter world. This is where you get the money, folks. How much does work debt cost, Sam? $3 $3 at oh, a time. Oh, yeah. Is that right? $3.4 trillion annually in the U.S. alone, $9 trillion globally. Comes yeah, that's from according to Gary Hamill. Yeah. Yeah. And Michele Zanini, friend of the show. That's so much money. There's so much gold in these hills, y'all. And every time yeah. somebody is like, we need to reduce costs. We need to reduce headcount. We need to grow top line revenue, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, are you looking under the hood right. at org debt because like the money and the energy is just seeping out of the car like and puddling on the ground and you're not even paying attention to it yeah all right well we're done for today which means we can talk about what we're going to do in our next episode which is Yay. the one that we've been waiting for for this entire arc it's the ask us anything episode Woo-hoo. we've been getting questions from listeners and it's going to be Pretty fun to answer them. Plus, I'm pretty sure we can break the brave new work record of four questions answered in a single episode. I did not write this, and I am not committing to that because okay. we have a way of finding rabbit holes. I know. I'm committing we do. to three, or maybe we'll get through seven. Should we get a pool going? Do you have the over <laughs> on three? Uh, well, I feel like I shouldn't be allowed to bet in this because I have a lot of control over how, uh, how many true. we do. Hmm. That's true. We'll have to figure Fair out enough. a better plan on that. I bet you we okay. can do more than four. Send us lots of questions. We have lots to choose yeah. from. And it'll be a better episode for everybody. That's true. We'll also keep it tighter if there's a lot of questions because we'll want to get through them. We, we will. Until then, you can keep learning more about what's next for HR at theready.com forward slash FOHR. And hook us up with your CHRO, your HRBP, CPO, other initialisms. All of them. We love to meet them. That's right. We're having a great time out here. Thank you, as always, to Taylor Marvin for making us sound fantastico. This mini series is produced by The Ready, where we help organizations around the world change the way they work. You can get in touch with us by emailing fohr at theready.com. As for you, HR folks, leaders, friends listening right now, let's change ourselves first. 